Okay, just to get started on time, uh, we were discussing up to last time the uh, single effect evaporation system, which is basically made of two components, uh, a, a condenser, or sometimes it's called as uh, a feed preheater, because it condenses the vapor coming from the evaporator while it is heating, uh, uh, while it is heating the seawater which is coming in, which is a form of energy recovery, so that the energy of condensation associated with condensation of the vapor will not be lost, but we can make use of it for preheating the seawater. And preheating the seawater will help us reduce the quantity of steam required in the evaporator. The evaporator is the second main component where basically the seawater is sprayed in uh, on the surface of a tube bundle. Inside the tube bundles, there's steam coming from a power plant or a boiler. Steam is condensing, given off the latent heat. And the latent heat is used to first preheat or heat the feed from its inlet temperature TF to the saturation temperature TB. Part of it will evaporate and the rest is going to be rejected as rejected brine. The vapor will go to condense and the condenser and so on. Problems associated with this, it has poor performance because basically, as we discussed it before, we have been rejecting streams of relatively high energy content to the surrounding. The rejected brine is leaving at saturation temperature, which is according to the numeric example that we have solved, we are something in the order of 70 to 75 degrees centigrade. So you are throwing, you are heating the seawater to a value of 70 or 75, and then you are throwing it away. So this is some sort of a waste of energy associated with this type of systems. Also, the feed seawater, we are heating it from tea cooling water to tea feed. Again, according to the example that we had, we are heating seawater from something like 25 to 35 or to 70 degrees centigrade and then throwing it away again. So it has considerable amount of losses of energy that we are rejecting to the surroundings. And this is one of the main disadvantages of this system. And that's why the system cannot be found uh, in, in many, many applications. We said one of the applications, you can find it on, on ships that are traveling for long distances, staying months in the sea or so. But no uh, substantial uh, application of this type in industrial desalination because it has uh, so many wastes of energy associated with this. And people re replace it with other systems where this kind of rejected brine can be reutilized, as we will see later. But before we do that, we are considering one kind of improvement to the performance of this system that can be done by adding a vapor compression unit. The vapor compression unit, sometimes you call it thermal vapor compression, and so, or TVC, and sometimes we refer to it as the ejector. Uh, the kind of compression units that we can have are not only the thermal vapor compression, not only the ejector is going to be associated with this system, but the other alternatives. For example, next topic, we're going to talk about a single effect evaporation with mechanical vapor compression. So we can use a mechanical vapor compressor and we will not use any steam from a power plant or a boiler coming in. The mechanical vapor compression is going to um, compress the vapor and thus increasing its pressure and temperature. So that makes a standalone unit. Or the problem again with mechanical vapor compression is that the power requirement to run the compressors is, is normally high. So to avoid that, Absorption vapor compression came in so that without you, without the need of using a, a vapor compressor, we can use a pump that pumps basically desiccant, or um, we can we can talk about it as some sort of a liquid dryer or so, so that you know that a, using a, a pump is going to reduce much of the energy needed to increase the pressure, or adsorption, which is again. Uh, some sort of a, uh, a, a technique 
which instead of using absorption where something like lithium bromide or lithium chloride or calcium chloride can uh, absorb the water in and then you can compress it. No, the other one we are talking about solid material which is able to absorb the material on, or the water vapor on the surface and then dissolve it again. These are different techniques of improvements of the single effect evaporation. We are now going to consider the first one of them, which is the thermal vapor compression unit. And as you see, uh, probably I made that sketch at the, at the end of last class, where basically it's not only the two components that we have, the, um, the condenser and the evaporator, but we have a little bit more than that in terms of the unit that we have, which is sketched in blue, which is basically uh, what we refer to as the uh, thermal vapor compressor or thermo vapor compressor or the TVC or the ejector. So that is what makes a difference compared to the previous one. And we will see that adding this small unit right here would make a big difference in the system operation, specifically talking about the, um, the performance ratio of the unit. So let's look at what happens here. Basically, we have an evaporator, as you can see it here. The evaporator receives the feed here as M dot feed. The feed is going to be sprayed on the surface of these tubes. These tubes are having steam inside here. So that steam will condense, it will give the latent heat as we described earlier. And then the thin film of seawater is going to be heated on the surface of the tubes. It will reach saturation temperature and then part of it will rise as vapor. And whatever or not evaporate is going to be collected down as brine where this brine is going to be rejected. Now the vapor that will rise here is going to leave the evaporator and before it reaches the condenser, it is exposed to the inlet of the motive steam or the inlet of the TVC. Again, the thermal vapor compression, we refer to it as TVC and sometimes we call it as an ejector. So what will happen here? This ejector is receiving motive steam. This is the steam that we get from the power plant or from the boiler. So either it's a line extracted from the turbine of the power plant, or you may have a boiler that provides steams he steam here at relatively high temperature. Steam is going to enter into a nozzle part, something that looks like a nozzle, in which the area is decreasing so the speed is increasing until it reaches sonic speed, a little bit subsonic after the throat of the nozzle. And when we are talking about the speed or velocity of the vapor to be very high or the steam to be very high, what will happen to the pressure? As the velocity increases, what happens to the pressure? What do you think? It should be decreases. Decrease. Yeah, the pressure is going to decrease and it will decrease dramatically so that this vapor or this location here is going to be under vacuum. So this vacuum is going to result in some of the vapor which is leaving the evaporator is going to get here into the throat of the ejector. This is what we call entrained vapor. Why it is entrained? It is entrained by the low pressure that has been created in the throat. And the low pressure has been created by the very high speed of the steam which is passing in here. So part of the vapor is going to be entrained and the rest here, which is basically M dot vapor minus M dot entrained vapor. This is going to go to the condenser. So the quantity of vapor or the rate of flow rate that of the vapor that comes to the condenser is less, 
And accordingly, one benefit that we can see here is that we are going to have lower condenser area compared to the previous system, where we don't have this TVC. What else? Now, this stream of the motive steam, M dot motive, is going to be mixing with M dot entrained vapor as they get into here to this unit just right after the throat. It's called the mixing zone. And after that, it will go through a diffuser. In the diffuser, what happens? The velocity decreases and the pressure increases. So that's why it's called the thermocompressor. You are compressing the vapor without any moving part. And you are going to get that as the, at the required outlet temperature that we call PS. So here we're talking about uh, roughly uh, saturated vapor at PS at temperature TS, which is going to enter into the evaporator. Now, the flow which is coming in here is again, as we said, it's a combination of M dot motive steam plus M dot entrained vapor. The entrained vapor is our own product. It's something that we have created as the vapor has formed here. So this is all, both of them are going to enter into the tube side or tube bundle in, uh, in the evaporator. They will condense. After they condense, the M dot entrained vapor, we're going to take it back. Now it has condensed, so it's liquid now. So we're going to take this flow rate so that it would join the quantity that has condensed in the condenser. So the entrained vapor is collected here. And the M dot motive is returned back again to the power plant. So we have M dot entrained vapor here. And this is going to be added to this quantity. So what we are going to get at the end is M dot vapor, or what we used to call M dot distillate. So we did not lose any mass flow rate, but we have, we have gained a couple of benefits. The first benefit is we have reduced the quantity of steam that we are getting from the external source. And instead of getting the whole steam from the power plant, we are getting only a part of it, which is M dot motive. The rest is something that we have generated already. So when we are talking about the performance ratio of the unit, performance ratio is normally the M dot distillate divided by the steam coming from the external source. In our case, it will be M dot M. And M dot M is less than M dot steam. So we have reduced this quantity. And according that, the PR is going to increase. And the second benefit in terms of the total surface area needed in the condenser is less, because now we are condensing less quantity of vapor, since part of the vapor has been extracted or entrained to the ejector and then used for heating. So this is the kind of two benefits that we are getting from using a system like this. Um, any questions? Yes, go ahead, Khaled. Yes, I'm wondering, Doctor, why we utilize a part of the vapor to, to be as our uh, speed in the steam in this case, we 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 are considering uh, from this whole system is to generate or produce as much as desalinated water as we want, right? So yes. if we use a part of it, then this is would decrease the production of the sweet water. Uh, thank you for your question, but we are not decreasing it because the quantity that has been entrained here, we have already got it back. Ah, okay. So, so you see condensed in the evaporator. We are, we are retaining it back here. So we did not lose any M dot distillate. The quantity is, is the same, but we did reduce the external source of energy. Remember that when we are using a, a desalination system, two things that we are interested in. If we can fulfill both of them, it will be okay. If we can fulfill one of them, it will be fine as well. Here we, we have fulfilled one of them, which is we have reduced the external steam source which is coming to the unit. 
but the quantity of the distillate did not change. Okay, is it clear? Yes, thank you, Doctor. And, uh, yeah, تفضل تفضل عبد who's the Ahmed? تفضل يا Ahmed. Uh, is the steam that coming from the power plant uh, desalinated already? Is it what? The steam that comes from the power plant. Yes. Is it is it already desalinated? And is it? Uh, oh yes. I mean, the power plant you cannot run except very pure water. The water has to be even more stringent than the water that we drink. If you remember, we talked before about the water that we drink, that we can have a few hundred of uh, ppms of salt in it, and which is needed for our bodies. Something like we can we can have it with the the the, the bottled water that we, that you are buying is having about 130 to 150 ppm. We can drink nicely up to 500 ppm. We can still be able to drink water up to 1,000 ppm. This is the water that we drink. But industrial applications, like in a steam power plant, the boiler, the turbine, the feed water heaters, the condenser, the steam there should not increase its salinity more than 5 ppm. So it's uh, extra pure sort of vapor which is being used. So don't worry about this because the steam that we are getting is always pure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now, having looked at the system that we have this described now, we are talking about three components, the condenser that we have seen earlier, the evaporator that we have seen and evaluated earlier, and the new unit, which is the motor steam, which is, uh, which is basically the, the thermo vapor compressor, the TVC or the ejector. And probably if you are going to pass by any one of the desalination systems that are existing either in um, in Khobar in al-Azizia or the one which is in, uh, in Jubail or Marafiq in Jubail as well, you will always see on top of the desalination unit there's something which is too long, few meters long, and it is taken that shape, the shape of a conversion divergent nozzle or a Venturi sort of thing. This is the TVC. And this be become, or it has become an essential part of a desalination system. And it has several utilizations as I'm going to talk about. Now, in, in one application, it helps in the improvement of the operation of a desalination system through entrainment of, of some of the formed vapor to, and then pressurize it to make our input heating vapor or steam. Remember also that it creates vacuum and creating vacuum is a very important application in the industry so that we can use another ejector in the desalination system to get rid of the non-condensable gases. The, the, the evaporator is normally operating below, below atmospheric temperature. And we said that the seawater when you evaporate it then there are some components that are non-condensable, like carbon dioxide. How can you get rid of that? You can connect it by a vent, and the vent is connected to a thermal vapor compressor. You don't have to run steam there, but you can run air. Anyway, you create vacuum so that you can get rid of the non-condensable gases. The TVCs or the ejectors are also used in the refrigeration industry because creating vapor, uh, creating vacuum to the vapor means reducing its temperature, which means reducing its temperature as well, not only the pressure. So here we are talking about several applications in industry where this unit, the unit that does, does not have any moving part is an essential element of that system. By the way, the efficiency of the ejectors is something that does not exceed 30%, which means that there is a room for improvement for these units. They are critical, they should be operating at certain operating conditions, otherwise they will not function well. And there's a lot of work to be done in improving the performance of the ejectors. There are so many patents that have been made for imagining how the performance of the ejectors can be improved. 
And there are so many studies that are made only for this. Actually, at a certain time, we were looking for a master student or a PhD student who is able to, to do some sort of a CFD simulation to what happens in here. And the process is, is a little bit complicated because when you are talking about uh, a sonic speed at the throat, which is the speed of sound, and sometimes the throat is having a conversion diversion nozzle inside so that you can have a supersonic speed. After that, sometimes a shock wave occurs in the diffuser where a sudden reduction in pressure occurs. So this, there are some issues and studies that still need to be done for understanding more or simulating exactly what would be happening inside a thermal vapor compressor. We are not going to get into that detailed analysis in our presentation for that course, but at least we'll be exposed to a knowledge how, how velocity and pressure are going to change in, inside this unit. And when it comes to the analysis, we are going to use some sort of a uh, famous correlation that will just in probably one line and a couple of definitions will summarize how the performance of this unit can be calculated. So these are the, the components of the unit, evaporator, condenser, and ejector. The evaporator as usual is having um, a heat exchanger, which is the tube bundle space for the vapor to form, spraying system, nozzles to spray the seawater in, mist eliminator to prevent any droplets of seawater carried by the vapor to leave the unit. They should be returned back and either evaporated or rejected as a rejected brine. The ejector has a nozzle, steam nozzle, a suction chamber, an area for sucking the entrained vapor in, a mixing nozzle where you are mixing the motive steam with the entrained vapor and a diffuser where the velocity reduces and the pressure increases. And that's why it's called a thermo vapor compressor because we are compressing the vapor without any moving part just by using a diffuser. What you see in front of you here is a sketch of, um, of an, a thermal ejector or a thermo vapor compressor and the corresponding pressure and velocity uh, changes within the unit. The motive steam is coming from the left, from this end here, from the power plant, sorry. So steam from the power plant is coming to enter here. As it enters, it goes into a conversion diversion nozzle, as you can see here. So as it goes to the conversion part of the nozzle, the velocity is going to keep increasing until it reaches the sonic speed, speed of sound at the throat. And then in the conversion part, that the speed is going to further increase and then you are going to have some sort of a supersonic speed here. So we have supersonic flow of the motive steam coming in here. This is whole is a compartment. This is a chamber, a room. And this room, when we have supersonic speed here, it means that it is going to be at very low pressure. And this is a low pressure that you can see it here. The pressure is, uh, is, is keeping reducing, as you can see here, up to the throat, reducing further, reaching for the lowest pressure in this area, which is the highest speed in general. And this low pressure is going to entrain some of the vapor to enter in here. So the velocity increases to sonic speed and then supersonic speed. It reaches the maximum value at the exit of the conversion diversion nozzle. And after that, the velocity is going to reduce a little bit. This is the maximum, maximum velocity point or lower pressure point. And after that, we have a throat. We're basically mixing of the two streams occurs in this throat. And this is one of the sources of entropy generation within the unit, because if you remember from thermodynamic study that entropy is generated due to temperature difference, to expansion, un unrestrained expansion, and mixing. And here there is a stream of motive steam coming in, a stream of entrained vapor is coming also in, and they mix together here. So this is, it's a constant, 
cross-sectional area uh, pipe where mixing will occur, and that's why the pressure does not change much here. The changes in velocity, it's just because one of the streams is coming at very high velocity and the one is coming at relatively lower velocity, so that creates this kind of, of kinks here for the, for the velocity. And then by the end of the throat, there is the diffuser part. And in the diffuser part, there is an increase in the pressure. As you can see it here, pressure increases until the delivery pressure or the exit pressure or the steam pressure at the end of the unit. And as the pressure increases, the velocity decreases, as you can see it here. And then it leaves here with PS, which is high enough to be used as the inlet stream of uh, of the steam which is going to enter to the evaporator. So this is basically is at PS and the corresponding temperature, which is TS. So that's what happens here in, um, in, in, in the thermal, thermal ejector. You can find detailed information in the source, which is uh, fundamental of salt water desalination by Hisham Dusukhi and Hisham Tuni. I'm going today to upload uh, this, it's, it's a book, and this book is going to be uploaded today in, uh, in the Blackboard. The book, we did not talk about it before, because before we were, talk we were talking about units of non-conventional desalination systems, like the solar stills and the humidification, demification systems. But once we get into this conventional desalination system, which is basically single effect evaporation, multi-effect evaporation, and then multi-stage flash, then you are going to return or refer to the book for further details. After that, the condenser, nothing new in the condenser. It is just uh, condensing the vapor, removing heat or rejecting heat from the vapor, which is used to increase the temperature of the coming seawater just to, for improvement of the PR or just to reduce the quantity of steam needed for boiling the water in the evaporator. The seawater that comes in in the condenser, after being heated in the condenser, we take it and we chemically treat it so that some uh, additives of chemicals are going to be added to the system. These chemicals are basically the anti-corrosion, anti-fouling, and anti-scaling elements that are added here to protect the surface of our tubes from scaling, from corrosion, from fouling, and so on. And then, TB is the saturation temperature of the seawater that comes in or uh, that is sprayed in the ejector, uh, sorry, sprayed in the sprayers of the evaporator. And as the vapor forms, the vapor temperature is less than the salty water temperature by what we called the boiling point elevation, BPE, as we discussed earlier. The BPE can be calculated by some correlations or now it is built in the engineering equation solver. If you have the engineering equation solver, you can get the BPE as a function of temperature of the saline water, the salinity, and the pressure. We talked about the mist eliminator earlier, or the demister, that result in a little decrease in the pressure. Normally in our calculations, we neglect this decrease in the pressure, and that, and practically speaking, in reality, it reduces the temperature a little bit below TV. And then the vapor leaving the mist eliminator is splitted. Part of it is going to enter to the condenser M dot C, and the rest M dot entrained vapor is entrained into the ejector. So M dot C plus M dot entrained vapor makes M dot vapor or M dot desalination, which is obtained from the unit. Thermal ejector, generally speaking, it increases the pressure of the entrained vapor, M dot entrained vapor, from PEV, again, EV stands for entrained vapor, vapor to PS. And that defines what we call the compression ratio. So the compression ratio of the ejector is the ratio between PS, the delivery pressure, to the entrained inlet pressure, which is P entrained vapor. Uh, the motive steam expands in the nozzle and then in the diffuser, where basically we are converting the pressure into kinetic energy. 
this is again some sort of a detailed description that I've done on the figure, or I'm just writing here in the form of bullets, so that when you are reading it in your own, you just remember what we talked about and the several stages that the vapor undergoes inside the thermal ejector or the, the, the TVC, a thermal vapor compressor. We're talking about supersonic speed leaving the conversion diversion nozzle, creating very low pressure. The low pressure entrains the vapor in, it mixes with it in the uh, in the mixing zone of the venturi or the whole unit, and after that, it will go through the diffuser where the velocity de decreases, uh, pressure increases, and then we are getting our product at PS. When we are talking about the performance of the ejector, then the, the two components that we are considering for the analysis are basically two. One of them, or the first one of them is uh, what we refer to as the entrainment ratio, which is this. It is the ratio between the flow rate of the motive steam divided by the flow rate of the entrained vapor and the compression ratio, which is the delivery pressure from the TVC divided by the entrained vapor pressure. So these are the two components or two elements or two quantities that are newly introduced to our unit here. Since we are talking about an ejector, then we have to utilize the entrainment ratio and we have sometimes to utilize the compression ratio. Now, there are some, some sort of a limit for the entrainment ratio so that it would apply. And this all is given in the correlation which is used to calculate the entrainment ratio. What you see here is the defining relation. The entrainment ratio is nothing but the motive steam flow rate divided by the entrained vapor flow rate. And we are going to use this in our model when, when we put it into equations. And the compression ratio again is PS over PV. And this is always greater than one because we are talking about the compression here. What you see in front of you here is not new to us. We are talking about the mass balance, the feed that enters to the evaporator. Part of it will evaporate, which is the vapor. That is basically our M dot D. And part will not evaporate, will be rejected as brine, which is this. The second equation should be the salt balance equation, M dot F X F is equal to M dot brine, rejected brine X B. Both of those equations together can be utilized to obtain this expression here. Now, for the evaporator, previously we used to write M dot steam into HFG of steam. This is what we did in our previous class. Now, this M dot steam for us now is going to be a combination of M dot motive steam plus M dot entrained vapor. The right hand side remains as is, nothing changes here. You are heating the feed from TF to TB, and then you are evaporating part of the feed, which is M dot distillate. So the right hand side of the equation has not changed. The left hand side, it's just the M dot is coming from two components here. And the condenser, remember, and this is a common mistake while you are solving problems related to the TVC, that this flow rate here, this is not the distillate, it's only a part of it. And this part is basically M dot distillate minus M dot entrained vapor. Less vapor is coming to the condenser. The, the lambda here basically is the HFG. In the engineering unit, sometimes they refer to it as lambda. So this is Q in the condenser. The flow rate of the M dot condenser and this is going to be used for increasing the temperature of seawater and feed water from T cooling water to TF. And we are getting a couple of benefits here. Number one, because this mass flow rate is less, then you are going to need smaller surface area. But it's not only that, but because it's less, you are going to need less cooling water flow rate. So even the capital cost is going to be reduced by having a smaller condenser, 
and by having a smaller pump so that you are pumping less quantity of fluid here. So even the running cost of pumping water is going to be less because M dot cooling water has been decreased. So you are talking about just adding the ejector has resulted in several benefits that we are getting for the unit. These are the equations that you have seen last time, nothing new here, talking about in the evaporator, Q is equal to the area into the overall heat transfer coefficient into the temperature difference. And again, here we are neglecting the sensible heating of the seawater, we are considering only the evaporator part. And for the condenser, we are talking about Q condenser is equal to the area of the condenser, surface area of the condenser into the overall heat transfer coefficient into the log mean temperature difference. Why? Because basically this is T vapor and you are increasing the seawater temperature from T cooling water to T feed. So we have delta T1, we have delta T2, from which we can calculate the log mean temperature difference. So nothing is new in terms of the analysis except for the first equation that we wrote for the evaporator. We have, instead of MS, we have M dot of the entrained vapor plus M dot motive. Now, this equation is going to be needed in our analysis because we need to calculate what's the value of Ra. Normally the unknowns, we don't know how much is the entrained vapor. So we need to relate that to something that we know. And that's why based on several Uh, doctor, analysis or the for, for, for performance of the ejector. Ra, the entrainment ratio, is given as the function of steam pressure, entrain yeah. pressure, motive pressure, and here we have a pressure and temperature correction factors where the pressure correction factor is given as a function of the motive steam pressure. And the temperature correction factor is getting is obtained in terms of the temperature of the entrained vein. So this equation, you don't have to memorize it, by the way, that should be provided to you. And you are going to use this equation to obtain the entrainment ratio. What's the entrainment ratio? If you remember, again, the entrainment ratio is by definition, the M dot motive steam over M dot entrained vein. So once you know this value, you have established a relation between the motive steam and the entrained vapor flow rates. And that additional equation is going to be added to the equations that we have written earlier, and that will make the system complete. Number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns. Uh, what we may get into right now is, is some sort of a numerical example that we can look at to see what you see here is the results of the example. Let me share the example first the statement of the example, and then we can look how the solution can be made. 